So what we try to do is to understand how galaxy forms and evolve. And for that, we uh, have been using numerical simulations of galaxy formation. So just to give you a brief uh, introduction to the models. So these models uh, include the growth of the structure, the fall and the collapse of the uh, dark matter halos where the galaxies form uh, within a cosmological context. And these models also introduce recipes and numerical modeling to uh, follow the cooling of the gas according to the metallicity, to the chemical elements in the gas space, the condensation of the gas into the dark matter halos, and then the transformation of gas into stars. And uh, for, for stars of different stellar masses, we include a stellar evolution. So we follow, for example, massive galaxies and include the, um, the stellar feedback uh, the product, I mean, we take into account the production of chemical elements and the uh, ejection of these chemical elements together with the energy into the interstellar medium, also supernova 1A and AGBs. Um, so this was, it has been uh, the focus of my work for another 20 years, maybe, <laughs> where we started to include chemical evolution or chemical, yeah, chemical evolution into the, uh, these models of galaxy formation. Um, to complete for several reasons. First, because they modify the cooling rates of the gas. So it is important if we want to follow the how the gas evolve in the dark matter halos and how in and in the interstellar medium of the galaxies, uh, we need to, in, to try to um, uh, describe these processes in a more physical way. So chemical abundances are important. They can change by a couple of order of magnitude, the cooling rates of the gas in the very dense regions. Uh, and also because um, as galaxy form, oh, it's not, it doesn't want to obey me now. Why? Build it, build some main, mm, there, I have to pick, anyway, <laughs> so, so the, uh, as galaxy form and evolve, they uh, determine fundamental relations like between the mass, uh, the stellar mass, um, the circular velocity of the stellar mass and the size, but also there is there are relations or um, characteristics between the chemical abundances of the stellar population and the, for example, the dynamics or the kinematics of the stellar population. So we know that, for example, the bulge in the Milky Way had a stellar population with a certain um, kinematics and dynamics, and, but also uh, they have very particular um, chemical abundances and chemical properties, and they are different from the stars of the stellar population on the on the disk of the Milky Way. And when we want to um, uh, follow or understand how galaxies form, um, having this information within the consistently within the galaxy formation model, I, it's a very powerful tool to compare with observations and to understand. So <clears throat> this is, ah, the lights are not, well, the sun is out, so I won't complain. <laughs> it's not raining. <right. laughs> so this is one of the simulations, so just an example to see how they look like and how we can follow this uh, formation of the different halos and the structure. This is only the gas phase. And so we can follow with these uh, chemical evolution models how the properties of the gas change because of the formation of the stars, and then how the stellar populations um, frozen these uh, chemical abundances, and uh, if they reproduce or not the observations, or to what extent they are able to reproduce what we observe. So, so these are just some simulations, some set of simulations that we call Cielo simulations that uh, we are running in our group. So our one of the main uh, aspects or properties that we have been studying for a long time are metallicity, uh, the, the metallicity profiles, so the metallicity distribution in the star forming regions in disk. These are observations as an example uh, from the SAMI survey. So here we have uh, a set of uh, disk galaxies with their the, uh, metallicity profile, uh, oxygen over hydrogen. And we can see that in general, they are they have a negative metallicity gradient with the central regions more enriched than the outer parts, but the slope of these metallicity gradients are different. Some of them are weaker and some of them are very steep. 
And the idea of uh, what we try to understand if the, uh, the slope of the characteristic of this metallicity gradient can be linked to the history of formation of the galaxy or to, to the recent history of formation, depending if we are looking at, as in this case, to a star to the star forming region, or if we are looking to the stellar populations. Uh, so we have been focusing on these properties. And um, as we can see here on the left, uh, the metallicity gradients as a uh, show a trend with a stellar mass. And for many years, um, we thought that this trend was a positive one so that as we move to higher stellar mass, the metallicity gradients become flatter. Um, but uh, for lower stellar masses for many years, we had like a spread in, in metallicity gradients with not a clear trend, but the uh, just um, an indication of a larger variety of metallicity gradient gradients for lower stellar mass galaxy. But however, with the um, uh, with the observations from the Manga survey and the SAMI survey, where it has been possible to have a larger variety, a larger sample of galaxy, a, a larger variety of also of objects, um, kind of uh, different morphologies, um, it has been possible to see that there is a kind of a U shape distribution of dependency. So when we go to lower stellar masses, there is also um, a larger chances to have a flatter or weaker metallicity gradient and even positive metallicity gradient. So from this plot, we can see that um, the observations, uh, the real, I mean, the, the red points are the median values, but the gray points are the actual observations. And you can see that there is a large dispersion of values at a given stellar mass, also quite an, uh, significant error in the measurement of the metallicity gradient. So this trend is just a, maybe a global indication that there is some dependence with the stellar mass, but still I think we need to understand how this dependence, uh, um, what drives this dependency and, and what can we learn from this dispersion, this variety of metallicity gradient at a given stellar mass. So this is the, the picture at redshift zero. If we move to higher redshift, we have uh, uh, we have no clear trend with the stellar mass. Actually, this is a compilation of the more recent, I mean, yeah, a recent compilation of observations from redshift larger, about 0.5 to redshift, um, in general, redshift three, more or less. But there are also some very high redshift uh, measurements, like the star, which is the first. Uh, uh, metallicity gradient mentioned from the James Webb telescope, which was actually a positive metallicity gradient. So you can see that at high redshift, there is a large variability of metallicity gradient at a given stellar mass. So if they encode some information of the history of formation of the galaxy, it would be interesting to get that from the from the models, no? to be able to reproduce the trends of the evolution of the galaxy and see how they move uh, in this uh, plane as they evolve. Uh, here, uh, the points are the observations, but the shaded regions are different uh, relations coming out from, uh, from simulations. This is from fire simulations here, this band, and this is for PNG 50, and this one is from Eagles, the Eagle simulation. So in general, the, the, the results from the simulations depend on how uh, the supergrid physics or the physics, the, the physical processes are implemented in the numerical simulations. Although in general, they reproduce negative metallicity gradients, there is a variation, but observation seems, seems to um, show a, a larger diversity than what we get from uh, the models, okay? So the question is what drives these metallicity gradients? So we have been, Studying this in different simulations. So we started many years ago in 2016. We uh, studied the metallicity gradients and found in the cosmological simulations and found that in general they are negative, as you can see here on the left. Uh, these are two examples. So in general, they are negative as we observe, but also, but there are also in the 
And we found in the simulation some uh, galaxies that show this uh, inverted or positive metallicity gradient. So here, the blue lines represents the, uh, the metallicity distribution of the star forming regions. And in these cases, in the cases where, where we found this negative metallicity gradient in the star forming regions, uh, agrees with, uh, with systems that were undergoing galaxy interaction. So this has been also found in other, by other groups. And we know now that galaxy interactions and mergers can uh, drive uh, gas from the outer part to the inner region due to the tidal torques that are generated during the galaxy-galaxy interaction. And that can invert the metallicity rates. I will talk also about that uh, a little more about that uh, later. Uh, another process is that modifies the metallicity gradient is supernova feedback. And here we study uh, in the Eagle simulations, we study um, the, metalli the metallicity gradients as a function of the stellar mass, but now in three runs where the supernova feedback was changed, uh, uh, when we use a very strong supernova feedback, we got this relation in green, okay? Uh, sorry, a weak metallicity gradient. We got this relation with negative, more negative metallicity gradient at lower masses. But if we use a very strong metal, uh, feedback uh, prescription, then for the same galaxies, we have a similar, a different trend with more uh, flatter, even positive metallicity gradient for lower stellar masses and negative for uh, more uh, massive ones. So with the slope of the relation change. So supernova feedback, as also pointed out by other, other authors, are, uh, is a process that can change the distribution of metallicity in the galaxies and modify this uh, relation between the gradients and the stellar mass of the galaxy. Uh, if we look at the function of redshift, observations also show that uh, for, from, high, from low redshift to high redshift here, from redshift zero to redshift four, the metallicity gradients also evolve, and it seems that they become more positive or inverted as we go to higher version. Okay. And the fact, I mean, the, the galaxy formation models can reproduce this trend if we, if, um, and a strong supernova feedback is included. Okay. So this is exactly uh, what we got from uh, our models and everybody else with different, even with different supernova prescription always found, uh, uh, have found the this, this similar trends. So all the, the lines represent the models and again, the, the symbols represent the observations. But you have to use a very strong <clears throat> supernova feedback to actually get positive or inverted metallicity gradients at high redshift. So in order to study the evolution of, uh, the, evolution of the metallicity gradient, we uh, move to the Eagle simulations, where again, we can found, as I, may, as I said, galaxies with negative and positive metallicity gradients. And we work with, uh, with different simulations of this uh, project with a 100 megaparsec simulation and the 25 megaparsec simulation, a uh, box size simulation. So we have a large number of galaxies to make uh, any statistics, okay? So a redshift zero, this is what we get from uh, the simulations the Eagle simulations. <clears throat> we have the metallicity gradient and the stellar mass. Uh, the symbols represent, again, observations. So here, in the squares represents the median values from uh, Khalifa, the Khalifa survey. And the uh, lines represents the, uh, what we get from the Eagle simulation. So uh, in this case, we have separate the galaxies in different subsamples. So the galaxies that are very disk dominated and have a disk over the total mass ratio larger than 0.5 are represented by the dashed line. And in the Eagle simulation, they tend to have very weak metallicity gradient, but most of them uh, have a, a negative metallicity gradient. Okay? And the, the variability of metallicity gradient increased for lower stellar masses. Okay? So as we found in observations. When we divide the sample into galaxies that have had a merger uh, and not, uh, I haven't had any uh, mm, uh, merger, sorry, a uh, recent merger, um, we found two, two kinds of distribution. So the green one represents the, the 
the trend of the galaxy with no recent merger, and you can see that they are mostly, again, negative or weaker, very weak, on flat, on average. Uh, but as we move to lower masses, we have these uh, more negative uh, uh, systems um, with, um, sorry, system with more negative metallicity gradient. But the galaxy that have had a merger show a more uh, flatter uh, distribution. So the relation is a complex relation to interpret because it depends how you select your galaxy and which properties the galaxy have or which history they have. They seems to uh, determine a different uh, relation between the metallicity gradient and the stellar mass. Okay, so we did the same as a function of redshift using the same simulation. So this is between redshift zero and redshift 0.5 and between redshift 0.5 and 1.5 and then larger than 1.5 up to 2.5. Um, the, again, the gray symbol in this case are the observations that we found at each redshift. Uh, interval and the colors, the blue, the green, and the red are for, from the Eagle simulation and the pink from the illustrious TNG simulation. So different type of uh, codes, different models, and different super physics for the uh, supernova feedback and um, yeah, the cooling function. So very different models. Uh, in general, you can see that for the Eagle simulation, we found again very flat or very weak metallicity gradients. And then as we move to higher pressure, there is a trend for a larger dispersion and also for the gradients to be slightly more positive. But again, we have a, a large variety, a large uh, the, the diversity, and a lot of noise. I mean, the, the, the trends are very weak. There is always uh, in in the three redshift bins that are very the the trend between the metallicity gradient and the stellar mass is really weak. It's positive in general, but very weak. Um, if we look at the observations and try to do the same thing with the observations, the observations also show a very weak trend. So in general, there is still there is no clear evidence of uh, metallicity gradient versus the stellar mass relation as a function of redshift. We still have not so many points and not so many observations. And these observations uh, have a lot of error in the determination. And also I haven't mentioned, but um, there is also a problem with the, um, the um, metallicity indicators. Okay? The metallicity indicators depend a lot on how they are estimated and how they are calibrated. And they might change with a, with a redshift, but all this calibration in the observation has been made a redshift zero and then used or extrapolated uh, for higher redshift. Uh, so still, uh, there is a much to understand about how this um, metallicity gradient um, depend on the stellar mass as a function of redshift. Um, this is a, the same thing, but now uh, showing the median metallicity gradients as a function of redshift uh, for the Eagle simulation, which is the blue line. Okay, so it, it seems to be like a constant value, but this is because the evolution is really very small, it's minus 0 0.03 dex per kiloparsec per redshift. And this is more or less what they got from the illustrious simulation. So again, both simulations, both uh, kind of uh, codes and simulations seems to reproduce similar level of evolution. And the uh, black gray uh, symbols uh, show the, the comp a compilation uh, of observations. And you can see that the observations are, I mean, also show, as I said, a large dispersion and there is no clear trend except this slight uh, tendency to have more steeper uh, positive metallicity gradients at high redshift. So we wonder how this happened. And as I said, one of the possibilities uh, or what we show before uh, is that the, um, the mergers or the galaxy interactions are one of the mechanisms that can explain um, the at least the positive metallicity gradients because 
they are able to drive gas into the central region. And because originally galaxies tend to have a negative metallicity gradient, this gas that falls in has lower metallicity and hence decrease or dilute the metallicity in the central regions. And also we have supernova feedback that can blow part of the material in the central region and um, produce these negative metallicity gradients. So in order to try to see if that was happening in the Eagle simulation, we estimate the time to each major merger. So we took the galaxies at different redshift and find where was the, um, the, the recent, the most recent major merger, and also the most recent increase of uh, stellar mass uh, by more than 25% of the original stellar mass. So every time that a galaxy, uh, that we can measure a galaxy has an increase of more than 25%, uh, regardless of what process it caused this increase of the stellar mass, we, uh, we um, um, put it in our, in our catalog. So the last, on the, on the upper panels, we have a cumulative fraction of galaxies as a function of the time of the last merger, major merger. Okay? And in the lower panel, I show the cumulative fraction of the last time the galaxy has an increase of the stellar mass for more than 25%. This could have been due, due because uh, produced by a um, starburst or produced by immersion, okay? by, the, by the acquiring material from another galaxy. We don't care much. We just care to, uh, to individualize when there was a large change of the stellar mass that can have uh, disturbed the metallicity gradients. Um, okay, and then we divided the galaxies uh, by uh, stellar mass in three stellar mass beam that you can see up in the upper panels, in the upper levels. And within each group, we divided the galaxy according to the metallicity gradients. So pink are positive metallicity gradients and the teal lines show negative metallicity gradients. And the solid line represents uh, what we call strong positive, either negative, uh, sorry, positive uh, metallicity gradients in the case, of, in the case of the pink lines. And strong metallicity gradients are shown in dark, uh, thicker uh, uh, dashed lines. It's a very complicated <laughs> uh, plot to explain. So here we have the strong positive metallicity gradient. In here we have the strong negative metallicity gradient. And the other two lines, thinner lines, show the weaker, either positive or negative metallicity gradients. So what we wanted to see in it was if a recent major merger or a recent large increase of stellar mass tend to produce stronger either negative or positive metallicity gradients with respect to systems that didn't have a recent uh, major event uh, in their history of, of evolution. So we found that for low mass and intermediate mass galaxies, there is a trend to have a strong positive metallicity gradient associated to a merger or to a gas secretion that change more than 20% the mass of the galaxy. And the second more probable metallicity gradient are a strong negative metallicity gradient. In the case of massive galaxy, we found that a strong metallicity gradient were favored, meaning were more frequent for this, for galaxy with a major event, accretion event. Uh, so this, Kind of this uh, result or this finding is in agreement uh, to the, uh, with the idea that this large accretion of material can induce star formation, uh, I mean, gas inflow, star formation, and even supernova feedback and change the metallicity gradients to positive metallicity gradients in the case of intermediate and low mass galaxies. And in the case of the high mass galaxy, we found that negative metallicity gradients are the more frequent. And this is, we think this is because these more massive galaxies are more stable to galaxy interactions. So they can, uh, they are not destroyed and they can uh, 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 keep their metallicity, their negative metallicity gradient and even increase this metallicity gradient. 
So we found this uh, trend and we also make a, an estimation of how much or how long the galaxy keep this strong metallicity gradient. So what we saw here is that, you know, some galaxies have uh, strong metallicity gradient, but others have uh, weak metallicity gradient. So if they have had a, made a recent accretion and this accretion was able to drive gas into the central region, increase, uh, uh, dilute the metallicity gradient first, making this, uh, producing this positive metallicity gradient, this gas that is condensated in the central region will also feed the star formation activity. And when you feed the star formation activity, a lot of oxygen is produced. And because we are measuring the metallicity gradient of the oxygen uh, over hydrogen, that will produce an again at the steeper of the metallicity gradient, and they will be negative for some time. And then the supernova feedback will start to inject energy, producing outflows and ejecting part of the material out of the galaxy, and that will invert the metallicity gradient again. So if that was the case, we will have an steepness, uh, sorry, an inversion, steepness of the metallicity gradient, an inversion again, and then a recovery of the negative metallicity gradient, which is the normal gradient that galaxies seems to have. So that will be like a, a, a continuous change, okay? And we want to make sure if that was the case, we should find a time scale for that change. And we try to do that by stacking all the metallicity gradients and resetting the zero when they have a strong we can measure a strong metallicity gradient. So for each galaxy at each time, we find the time when they have a strong metallicity gradient, either positive or negative, and stack all the profiles at the time, at that time. And then we can have this kind of evolution where the zero point is reset at the time each galaxy has experienced a strong metallicity gradient. And we found this trend, so, well, from where we can measure a time scale that varies between 1.4 giga years and three giga years. And this is of course like a upper limits to the time scale of variation of the metallicity radiance that depends uh, on several things, but particularly on how many snapshots you have to actually measure the metallicity gradient in the simulation. So in the case of the Eagle simulation, this was the best that we could do because we have snapshots about 1.2, 1.3 giga years. So they are really uh, upper limits to this time variation of the metallicity rates. So because of this, we were we wanted to um, to to run to explore this with more detail, and because uh, maybe I should have started with this. <laughs> with slide, but we uh, we knew from prepare mergers, so simulations where you actually build up the galaxy and put them to interact, and um, we can follow where we can follow the evolution of the system and the metallicity gradient um, across time with a, a lot of snapshots. Uh, so we knew that if we have an interaction that is shown in the upper panel. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we knew that the metallicity gradient was going to evolve in this way from um, a negative one in the colors are kind of violet and blue to uh, a more flatter one. And you can see the different colors according to the different times. And the colors also respond to the, per the very center, the upper center and the second very center. So from this kind of repair simulation, we could we follow with more detail, the evolution of the distribution of chemical elements and the profiles in the inner region and in the outer region. Okay. So we knew that this there was a, a, a trend in how this uh, metallicity gradient vary along the interaction. Okay. Um, but in the Eagle simulation, it was kind of hard to get this because of these very um, few snapshots that we have to follow the whole evolution of the uh, during an interaction and the merger. Okay. Um, so what we did, we uh, then we decided to run our own simulations. Um, in this case, we decided to run 
zoom in simulations and to have an, a lot of snapshots to actually follow in time uh, the evolution of the metallicity gradients. Not in so much detail as this kind of simulation, but in, in detail, good, you know, with good resolution, uh, time resolution to follow the evolution, the change of the metallicity gradient as, as the galaxy evolved. So this is the kind of things that we wanted to follow. So the, here we have a galaxy interaction, but now in a cosmological simulation, we don't not only have one interaction, but sometimes we have several satellites that are contributing to the, to the galaxy, but we can follow in much more detail how the gas is transferred between the galaxies and how the metallicity of the gas are distributed or get you know, disturbed during these interactions. Uh, so this uh, simulation, these are this has been run for other purposes, but you can we can follow. You know, this is a galaxy following, falling into only once. Allow me to run. No, yeah, only once. <laughs> Sorry. So here we follow like different galaxies, different satellites falling into the potential well of a main galaxy, and we can follow how they they are disrupted. And how much material are contributing not only to the inter, inter circumgalactic medium but also to the galaxy itself. So we have using this simulation now for a while, and we have, as you can say, enough time steps to follow in detail what is going on, and to measure the here we measure the ramp pressure, the specific star formation rate, and the torques exerted over the satellite as they uh, approach the, the main galaxy. So we have the distance to the main galaxy in the y-axis and the time uh, of evolution in the, um, the x-axis. And you can see this has been displayed just to, to see them more clearly, clearly. And we can see the evolution of the torques, the evolution of the ramp pressure and the evolution of the specific star formation rate as the galaxy approach. So for these galaxies, um, so let me see, for this galaxy, we measure the metallicity gradient, these are observations. And what we found uh, for these galaxies is that in general, we cannot fit this, you can see it here in this simulation, you cannot fit the metallicity gradients with one slope, okay? We can do that at the beginning of the simulation when there is a clear negative, negative metallicity gradient, but then as the interaction takes place, the metallicities, the, the chemical abundance are distributed and the profile get broken, okay? So it changed in the central region and it also changed in the outer regions. And that change, that uh, how they break, depends on how the interaction proceeds or how the gas is accreted onto the galaxy. In the upper panels here, you can see uh, some observational results from Sanchez Mendiano in 2018, where she stuck different metallicity gradients and found also that the metallicity gradients, uh, these are new observations, also break. They cannot change the slope in the inner region, okay? and also in the outer part of the, uh, in the outer region of, of the disk. So in order to study these breaks in the metallicity gradient and how the metallicity profile actually change during the interaction, we decided to fit or to allow uh, not only um, one um, profile, but also we allow the profile to break in two parts, in the inner part and to have an outer break. And we uh, wrote a code to automatically um, fit this uh, inner and outer break. And so the idea was to understand when this the metallicity gradient breaks and what are the processes that break the metallicity gradients. Can you tell me when I am? Yeah. Tell me, it's, yeah, I think I, okay. So uh, we measure this in our simulations. So the gray points are again the observations and now the dotted uh, points uh, in colors are the simulations. 
And we have different metallicity gradients for each galaxy. Some galaxies have inner breaks, and they are shown as uh, these green uh, symbols. The outer breaks are shown as the, the orange ones. And the linear, which is the middle part, is shown in black. So depending on where, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Uh, what kind of profiles you have, uh, then the metallicity gradients will be different, of course. And um, the black ones are the ones that are, are more comparable to observations. Okay? Um, so because I only have 10 minutes, I will go quicker. So what we got from our simulation is that it will follow the evolution of the metallicity gradients, which are shown in the upper panel. This is only for one galaxy, like the Milky Way type galaxy. The black line, uh, shows the metallicity gradient in the middle part. And the, uh, the green one or the teal one shows the metallicity gradients in the inner region, which are mostly negative. And in the, the orange ones show uh, the metallicity in the outer part. So you can see that they change uh, as a function of time. We are going from redshift about 1.2 to redshift zero. And then here in the lower panel, you have the metallicity, the star formation, uh, right in each of the region, in the inner part, the median part, in the, in the outer part. So we can see that when there is a large change or break in the metallicity gradients, there is also an increase of the star formation activity in each of the regions, okay? And we can also follow the gas particles that fall in the different regions, in the inner, in the inner, mid, and outer regions, and estimate um, the accretion rate from different sources. So we study the secular evolution. So the gas that fa the falls from the outer part of the disk to the central part of the disk, the outflows, the, the gas that is ejected from the, from the galaxy, the gas that comes from the, the circumgalactic medium, the gas that comes from the satellites, and the gas that comes from filaments. And we can uh, distinguish the contribution in each of the different regions. So each time that the metallicity gradient breaks, we can actually uh, associate this to either secular, either secular evolution or the action of the satellite or the contribution from filaments. Like at very high redshift, most of the gas that comes uh, in the outer part of the galaxy um, comes from filaments, okay? And they also contribute to the different region as they move into the galaxy. And so we follow the different satellites for each of the galaxies uh, that we have. And uh, we follow also the metallicity gradients as a function of time. And we measure when they break. And we try, uh, we are actually uh, writing and preparing the paper. We associate each of the breaks to a particular process, either circular evolution, outflow, or circumgalactic medium. And we can do that. I mean, in this case, it was a dry merger. Uh, most of them are dry mergers. And you can actually see that here at high redshift, this is, uh, well, this is look back time, like uh, two bigger years ago. We have a very clear uh, negative metallicity slope, but then as the, as the satellite approach, there is a break probably because there is an infall of the gas. And then there is another break here. And then it changed, what it changes, where the breaks occur as a function of time, okay? So this is what we are trying to see and to relate the position of the break with, for example, the half mass radio of the galaxy to see if we can scale this break with some characteristic radio of, it, of the galaxy at the time of the, at each time. Okay, and then correlate that with the origin of the gas, from where the gas uh, falls in. Uh, in this case, we're showing another galaxy that have a, a very gas-rich accretion. So at some time we, we have, sorry, we start here, I started the other way around. Look back time, no, I'm fine. <laughs> Uh, we start with a negative metallicity gradient, and this metallicity gradient change as the satellites approach, and the gas is actually emitted. And here we can see that it is inverted. And then we cannot measure anymore the metallicity gradient because most of the gas that was in condition to form a star 
was heated up by the supernova uh, feedback, and we cannot, we don't have enough particles or enough gas to actually measure the, the metallicity radiance. And then when we, later on, we can measure it again, this uh, profile is broken now in the other part. So the idea of this project is actually to, as I say, to match or to try to understand these changes in the metallicity gradient as a function of time and relate them to the position of the fission and the characteristic of the satellites and the origin, like other um, processes, like um, accretion from the filaments or accretion from directly from the circumgalactic medium, even galactic fountains. We also follow the galactic the material that is ejected and then comes down after cooling, uh, cooling down. And to have a more uh, detailed description of the processes that change the, the distribution of chemical elements in the galaxies. But of course it takes a lot of time because there are many details and then um, um, we have decided to look to have a a low, uh, I mean, a small sample of simulated galaxy, but uh, very well understood all along the evolution. So the other um, uh, project that we have in mind is, um, well, we have this from the simulations and we want to compare this with observation. But as, as I say, uh, observers have to use some calibrator or uh, metallicity indicators to transform or to estimate the abundances. Okay, so when comparing simulations results, simulated results with observations, we are not exactly comparing the same thing. And here we are having, we are estimating the gas that is in condition of forming stars as H2 regions, because this is a gas that is cold and dense and has a larger probability to form stars, but it is not actually an H2 region. So in order to mimic this, we started a project to actually uh, simulate an IFU, IFU observation. So we have we had a galaxy here and we defined as pixels and we identified the population, the stellar particles and the stellar uh, the gas particles along these uh, spaxels. And we combine the information from the simulation with SIGAL, with the SIGAL, which is a, a synthesis um, energy distribution model based on the Broussard and Charlotte uh, models. Uh, so we can um, reconstruct or assign to each stellar particle that represents a single stellar population and have a given age and a given chemical uh, abundance. We can assign uh, a spectra, and with this spectra, we can add up the information and have the a continuum and the absorption line. So, so this is more or less what we got here. Uh, this is uh, the spectra that we get from this spectrum, which does not have any young stellar population. So we have this distribution of the continuum and some absorption, absorption lines. But we also can estimate the uh, the spectra of a star forming spaxel uh, by using SIGAL, which include um, emission lines. So this is a spectra that we can build up from our simulated IFO from a star forming region. And now we have the different lines and we can try to estimate the abundances and the star formation rate from these emission lines. So we have, we develop a model where we for example, define or assume that all the stars, uh, the stellar population younger than 10 to the seven years um, are considered young and we produce uh, emission lines and the rest will be old, we contribute to the old, uh, will be considered old stars and we contribute to the continuum. So to estimate the emission lines, we have to give the model some information that we try to extract also from the simulation, like the gas metallicity, the line width, by estimating the dispersion within each spaxel along the line of sight. And we also estimate an ionization parameter from uh, the information of the density of the gas, the electron density, and the temperature of the gas 
within each uh, item. So with this, we have a total spectrum from each of these voxels. Uh, we can actually change the size of the voxel or even rotate the galaxy and see it from a different angle. And from there, we can apply uh, different estimators to, uh, to obtain abundances. Okay? As, uh, and these chemical estimators are the same uh, used by observers. So first, before I show you the results, uh, let me introduce this relation, which is the result uh, mass metallicity relation. This is the uh, surface star formation rate density as a function of the stellar mass surface density. This is our observations from manga. Uh, you can see that there is a correlation between the surface density, the stellar surface density, and the star formation rate, and the uh, oxygen over hydrogen. Okay, So these are um, less enriched material here. And then as we move to high, the, um, high stellar mass uh, density, spaxels, we have a higher uh, metallicity. Or they are more enriched. Um, so this arrow shows you the correlation, uh, the secondary correlation on the uh, on the abundances. So we first measure that from the simulation directly, not using the, the spectrum, but the, the simulation itself, the, the abundances that comes out from the simulation. We estimate the star formation rate density and the stellar mass surface density, and we color by the oxygen over hydrogen from the simulation. And you can see that we get from the simulation similar trends. We have less points here. They have a lot of galaxies over there, a lot of these voxels, and we have only uh, several, like 20 galaxies contributing to this plot, but the trends is the same. So what we did is for each of these uh, spaxels, we estimate the spectra, and then we apply two metallicity indicators, oxygen three, nitrogen two, and uh, and we can see, I mean, we can reproduce, and you can see the, the trends, but they are not exactly the same. Depends a lot on which metallicity indicator you use. And we tried other metallicity indicators, and we sometimes do not reproduce the observations by using those metallicity indicators. Uh, these are the first results um, that we have gotten. But for these two particular metallicity indicators and from the simulated spectra, we can find similar trends with approximately similar angle of correlation. So the secondary correlation is present and in the same direction. We have higher metallicity abundances here in the larger densities. Uh, but also there are many considerations to do. For example, this um, metallicity uh, indicators works within certain range of metallicity. So we have more information in the simulations, which are not included here because they do not match the range of metallicity um, where this, calibrate, this indicator has been calibrated. But I think this is a very interesting, a very powerful tool to try to um, compare the simulations and the observations on more fair basis. And since I am late, and this is the last time. So I give you with a, a few conclusions, but this is more or less what I wanted to tell you about what we are doing and why we are studying the metallicity profiles uh, with the galaxy formation models. Thank you. Any questions? So um, I was interested to hear what you were saying about the simulations and the chances of, kind of looking at looking at your um, the metallicity gradients from different viewing angles and different projection effects. Did you did you say a little bit more about what the role of projection is in the metallicity gradients that you observe? Yeah, I, actually, I answered that. Uh, uh, that's what I want to we want to explore because I mean this work was done by Anel Cornejo, uh, who just finished the master. And two months ago, and she tried in the, the first paper to actually uh, present the, the tool. 
But the idea is yes, because we are comparing all the time with uh, with observations, and there is this inclination correction. And also, we have to take into account the dust effect. We have done that, but in a very simplistic way. Um, but yeah, I cannot tell you much. But the idea is to actually study this uh, in, uh, by varying the changing the the inclination and see how you know how the metallicity. 